this, this version of Electra is set in the countryside, right? Um, you also have Electra's situation. Um, she is now married to a, to a farmer. Um, she is quite literally in rags. Um, you also have, and I think this is one, one unappreciated, well, underappreciated aspect of the play. Is it ends in a del sex machina, quite spectacular. The second longest in, in surviving Greek tragedy, actually. So those things, but also, I mean, and, and, and a lot of critics have basically focused on the fact that it seems to portray or at least offer a different version of the murders uh, um, of Clytemnestra and Aegisthus. Now, in Aeschylus and in Sophocles, the, those murders seem to be justified, right? And here we can start thinking about the wider myth and sort of all the reasons for which, you know, obviously this is a, a story of revenge. Um, but in Euripides' version, um, obviously the story has to contain those murders. Those murders happen in the course of the action. But for the first time, you see Orestes and Electra almost expressing regret. Um, and there's this wonderful scene um, at the end after the, you know, the matricide, especially, where they are basically lamenting and almost, oh, they're almost, they're miming Clytemnestra's screams and kind of reenacting what happened. Obviously, all violent action and tragedy happens off stage. Um, and for those of you who study Greek tragedy, you may know that obviously the role of the messenger is quite important. But you have kind of all that offstage action, and you hear the offstage cries told and reenacted in this um, incredible lyric lament by, by, the, by the children. And, and there's a lot of emphasis in that, story, in that lament on you know, the mother who bore us and emphasizing her role as their mother. Um, and so that is quite shocking, I think. Um, and what I wanna say is, I mean, so a lot of critical attention has focused on this depiction of the matricide. And again, the, the emphasis on regret. And the key word that a lot of uh, critics use is, this is a more realist portrayal of the matricide. Euripides is interested in realism, right? Um, so I don't know if you've done any critical, this, this is the key word that sort of floats about, you know, this particular play. And what I find fascinating about that is that especially there's a body of, of literature on Greek tragedy, um, especially from the mid 20th century that's interested in this strand of realism, right? And what does Greek tragedy mean if it's realist? What is this Euripides doing? <laughs> um, and a lot of these conversations or these questions about its realism get uh, linked with ideas that this play is actually unheroic. And there's all these conceptions of, of, I mean, basically, I should just, well, this play in a way, because it differs from the other two, and because um, Euripides also has been charged with lots of things. I mean, it, it, we have to kind of here understand the way in which our conceptions of tragedy also depend on a privileging of, say, Sophocles, right? So Sophocles is always, you know, in modernity, you know, and a, since antiquity, Sophocles has been seen, you know, as the most sublime of the tragedians. And there's all these ways in which his version is the best. And here we have to also thank Aristotle and his poetics. So there's all these ways in which people, um, critics in modernity um, associate these sort of realist elements with, you know, it's, it's a charge against, you know, yeah, Euripides is not interested in heroic characters. And therefore, it must be bad. Um, and, <laughs> and, and I think so. So I, what I love about this play, um, I mean, obviously, in a way, I mean, all Greek tragedy is interested. I mean, if you look at, you know, I mean, obviously, we only have a very small portion of, 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 of plays that survive. We only have about what 33 out of, you know, I mean, if you think about the whole course of the fifth century and the fact that these plays were embedded in a festival context every year in Athens, there were um, you know, you know, there was a big competition, multiple tragedies. We only have a sort of a small portion that survives. And what I like, I mean, with these plays, we really get the sense in which tragedians were always interested in revisiting the same myth and telling it from lots of different perspectives and shifting the focus to, to, to get you to think about maybe hidden depths of that myth or, or, or different aspects of that story. And so these three, as well, I should say also, it's not just about Aeschylus's libation bearers and Sophocles' Electra and Euripides' Electra. We also have to think about Euripides' Orestes. Um, there's, there, there's the, you know, so we have, we happen to have that among the small portion of plays that survive, four of them that deal with the same myth. Um, and so I think um, this shows us that, again, the ways in which throughout the fifth century, people were playfully kind of altering the myth or changing the focus in different ways. Um, and of course, you know, 
to answer finally the question that you say, why this play has not been performed as often as the others, I think it has to do with the way in which it's been received or the ways in which conceptions of the tragic from antiquity to now get bound up in sort of certain, I think, idealistic, you know, tragedy is sublime. Tragedy should always be sad. Tragedy should be heroic, especially, I mean, especially in this case, I mean, we're dealing with a myth that obviously comes from Homer. You know, you can't get more heroic than Agamemnon and his family, you know. So, so there are ways in which I think um, certain expectations about, that have to do more with the weight of the classics and of these, you know, of, of the genre of tragedy and of epic in modernity that people associate certain values to that. And so here's Euripides doing what all other tragedians were doing in terms of sort of altering the, you know, altering myths in different ways. Um, sure, you know, he, he kind of places an intense focus on the matricide and what it means, you know, but he's doing what other tragedians have always done. And so I think this charge of realism, this charge of it's not heroic, it's more, it's a more on us, I think. Um, I mean, there's also, you can also point to, I guess, the textual transmission of these plays, right? So the fact that, you know, the Oristia of Aeschylus, also Sophocles' Electra, happened to survive as part of the classic seven that were chosen in antiquity as kind of the best plays. We have Euripides' Electra by pure accident, right? Like it was not one of the seven, or, you know, one of the, the, the top plays of Euripides that were then sort of collected. Um, you know, and have survived to us. It, it, we just happen to have it because there's been, um, <laughs> you know, there's been, they, they found um, a, a bunch of extra plays that, you know, that obviously they start with the, um, uh, with certain Greek letters of the alphabet that we just happen to have an extra scroll. And so that's why we have so many plays like Electra and Helen <laughs> that survived. <laughs> so there's a number of different things, but I, I guess the, the one thing to say, and I, I think I'll keep repeating this in this discussion, so what I love thinking about Euripides' Electra because obviously it points to, again, the, just to summarize, the, the ways in which in antiquity, um, tragedians were interested in sort of looking at the same myth from different perspectives. And, and again, the, the idea, there was, no, there was no canon of myth, right? So you can kind of play with mythical narratives in different ways. I think that's really important to understand about um, tragedy. But so there's that perspective. So it shows us that quite clearly, but also I think, um, for anyone who's interested in thinking about, um, you know, the reception of antique, of, sorry, of Greek tragedy from antiquity to now, Euripides' Electra really does show us the ways in which um, critics have attached all kinds of things. You know, they, they've labeled all these charges against it. They're always weighing poor Euripides' Electra against its, you know, Aeschylean and Sophoclean cousins, or I don't know what you want to call them, but they're always weighing it. They're always finding it wanting because they're always comparing it. And I just think to me, it just shows um, the ways in which, again, to understand tragedy, we not only have to understand its place and what was happening in antiquity, but also all the many ways in which people uh, have thought um, and have assumed certain things about the genre um, that affect the way that we interpret it. So that was... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. No, no, no. That was... So, so one of these very unheroic elements is the, is the setting, right? Because it's in the countryside. So... Um, why, why do you think we have that? And what does it add to the dramaturgy of, of the play? Yeah, this is a fascinating question. I mean, um, right. So what happens when Euripides changes the setting to the countryside, right? So, I mean, I guess I, here again, we always, I mean, this is the other thing with Euripides' lecture, we're always working in a comparative mode. We're always thinking, oh, what else happens in Sophocles? What else happens in Aeschylus? Um, so this is already different from the other two plays um, where say the house, right? So, so one thing that, you know, there's, you know, in the Oresteia, the house takes such a central role, the image of the actual, of the house and the family. And obviously it's tied to not only like, you know, the, the location of the house and, you know, Electra and libation bearers stepping outside the house, um, but the house of Atreus. Um, so in focusing it on the countryside, that is removed. So we no longer have that intense focus on the house. Um, the second thing is you no longer have the same intense focus on the tomb of Agamemnon, right? So when you first see Electra in Aeschylus' Libation Bearers, she's going to the tomb of, you know, she, she's introduced on her way to the tomb to place, you know, the libations, um, which goes to show, I mean, this is something that was um, proper, you know, this is something, you know, you honor the dead by um, visiting their tomb, but by placing in this whole other location, 
you kind of take away those two central points um, that, that have always played such an you know, important role in the myth. Um, and and in, the, in, the, in the dramatization of the myth in the Aeschylus and in the Sophocles. And so what's interesting now is obviously you do get mentioned in throughout the play, you know, to the house or, you know, the, you know, uh, you know, where Clytemnestra is a house and then also the tomb, but they're elsewhere and you have to kind of travel out, you, you know, you can think about the Greek theater, you have to travel via one of those ramps now to be able to access those spaces so you kind of just remove it's just a slight it's, a, it's an important shift in focus, I think. Um, and the other thing about the countryside, and I think this is something I hope we, we will continue to talk about, it's that it kind of enables or, or at least allows for some surprise for some, some surprises. So one of the things that you first see um, in the opening of the play, Orestes and Pylades arrive, um, and they're kind of looking <laughs> at this house, and they, they there's, you know, Orestes tells Pylades, oh, maybe. You know, we'll, we'll, a peasant woman or, you know, a farmer woman will, will come in and we'll find out, you know, what's happening. And he doesn't recognize his sister. So he mistakes her for her. <laughs> so, so there's also this element of humor or surprise. I don't know about humor, but maybe just surprise, right? So here's a very different Electra than what we're used to. You know, again, her name, Electra, you know, you might, she's, she's always defined by her, un, you know, unceasing, her, her always, um, eternal grief for her father. Um, but now we see her literally in quite different clothes in the different costume. Is she still Electra? <laughs> um, and I think also, but we, I mean, going back to the question about, um, uh, you know, well, obviously a lot of modern adaptations or people who adapt um, or well, generally people who produce the play of Electra always say they want to dramatize Sophocles. But there have been a number of adaptations. That is, um, a lot of um, artists and playwrights who in modernity want, you know, experiment with these myths and set them, or, you know, transpose them, you know, in different locations. Um, so they could be, you know, the 21st century streets of Los Angeles. They, they could be, you know, in South Africa, you know. And so what I like about this play in the countryside is I, I do think, um, literally, seeing Electra in rags. Um, this this idea, I think, is something that you see quite often in a lot of adaptations. Um, some adaptations that are more radical that want to see these Greek heroes in, you know, sort of street clothing or in, you know, just normal day-to-day -day garb. So I just, I mean, obviously, this is just me <laughs> making a connection, but I, I, I just think that the countryside kind of enables all these different possibilities um, for these characters. Yeah, you've you've touched upon the two elements which uh, which the students were kind of um, asking about. The first one is the recognition scene, which obviously is a <laughs> It's great, but also kind of worrying that they don't that Electra doesn't recognize um, uh, her brother, um, and the sort of the gender and power dynamic between the two. Um, so that's the first um, uh, question, and then the second the second aspect that you've um, that you've touched upon is humor, right? So the comic elements in the play, which you will see tonight. Um, I, I saw it last night, so I can tell you uh, that's the that's one of the things to look out for in the performance. Um, so both of these things, both of these aspects, which, yeah. So, okay, right, right. So those, <laughs> those are big topics, so right. So I guess I'll take maybe the, the question about the recognition scene, right? So, I mean, I mentioned the fact that I guess when, well, when Orestes first sees Electra, he doesn't recognize her because she's <laughs> in these different clothes. But another sort of, you know, central or sort of notable feature of Euripides' Electra is the, um, the fact that it kind of plays or maybe flirts with the famous recognition scene that you see in Aeschylus um, in the libation bearers. Um, so um, for those of you, I mean, I hope I'm not, I mean, I, I think most of you will have read the play. I hope I'm not ruining it for anybody, any <laughs> spoiler alerts. No, but um, so one, quite early on in the play, you have um, the two siblings um, encounter one another. Um, but interestingly, in this play, you also have, I mean, in addition to the farmer to whom Electra's married, you have this other old man character you have a, a number of old of, of minor characters who come in, um, and in this particular case, the old man facilitates a recognition between Orestes and Electra. Um, what's fascinating is that um, in, if you read the Libation Bearers, there are these famous, I think there are three famous tokens by which Electra is able to recognize her brother. Uh, a lock of hair that she compares, oh look, it looks like mine, <laughs> uh, a footprint, 
uh, oh, it's just like mine. <laughs> and then there's like a cloth or some. So there's these ways in which, I mean, this is not a problem in East Coast. These three tokens enable, she's like, wow, this is the reason why, the, you know, she, she, she knows Orestes is here through these three items. So in this play, I think Euripides is poking fun at that, but, but well, well, you can call it poking fun, but I think it's, it's much more about making you aware of a number of different things. So in this play, what happens is there's this old man who basically comes in and presents Electra with these same three tokens the hair, the footprint, and the cloth that she, you know, that I guess baby Orestes had. Um, and she rejects them. So the first one is, <laughs> here's a lock of hair. <laughs> and um, it looks just like yours. And she's like, actually, <laughs> she rejects it, I think, on the basis of two arguments. First of all, um, you know, oh, but Orestes is, a, you know, he's a man and he's involved in all these activities, outdoor activities. And I, you know, wherever it, 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 she points to some basic gender differences that would mean, I guess, maybe he's outdoors more. And also, you know, not all family members have to have the same hair. <laughs> um, the other one is the footprints. Um, <laughs> and what is it? I mean, I, I think she also points to the fact that, you know, men's feet are larger. Like, that's ridiculous. How can you? <laughs> Um, and I think, I don't know if there's also a reference to the rocky ground of the countryside. And so there's all that. And then also the, the old man then said, but what about this cloth? I mean, it looks just like the one that you left him with when he was a baby. And then she points out again, why would a man be wearing or carrying the same thing that he had when he was a baby? So there's, so you're kind of poking, or, well, you can call it poking fun, but it's much more kind of drawing attention to these tokens and, and, and there's a clear link that, you know, Euripides wants you to think of the scene and libation bearers. Um, and, and of course, I mean, uh, you know, so what actually does, well, I should say that what she, what, what ends up convincing her is the scar. Um, so the old man points out, oh, he has a scar. And then actually that is seen as much more reliable evidence um, than these random three tokens that work so well in the Aeschylus. Here is a scar, you may think of other famous scars, you know, and, and you know, you can think about, I don't know, Odysseus. I mean, you, you, can, you can start thinking about other sort of layers or other sort of gestures to other texts that I think might be fascinating. But what I like, so, that, so there's all these questions again, and I think going back to that idea of this being the least popular one, this is another reason why some people, some critics have said, oh, this realist Electra. Um, you know, how can you poke fun at these three tokens that were so important, so central for the Aeschylus? Um, but I think, I mean, I, I, you know, I would like to think that Euripides is kind of drawing attention to the way in which, you know, these dramatic, you know, these tokens are kind of these conventional things. Um, and by kind of putting a spotlight on them, you know, he draws attention to how they have to, you know, for them to work, they have to be invisible. And, uh, you know, so you have to kind of, well, you have to not question them, basically. You have to kind of take them at face value. So I think there's, a, there's, there's, there's some questioning and drawing attention to the way in which maybe in other areas of literature, you just kind of accept blindly some of these tokens. But uh, I, I would like to think that he's not just poking fun at East, but it's kind of just drawing attention to maybe dramatic conventions in general. I don't know. Um, yeah, so that was... <laughs> That was question number one. That was, that was uh, the, uh, yes, the question about the recognition scene. Um, yes, um, the other thing, I mean, I should, I mean, I, I, there's another thing to say, I mean, just before I jump to the, to the humor question, I, there's something about the recognition scene too that I think enables you to see a more intimate dynamic between Electra and Orestes as well. Um, and the whole play is really invested in that relationship and thinking about the two of them together. Um, and obviously they both, commit the matricide here. You know, it's not like in Sophocles where Electra's kind of outside egging him on. Um, they're both here. So I think they're, they're interested in this um, dynamic with the siblings. Um, and I just also want to say that the play, I think the play is intensely interested in these close knit family relationships, much more so than others. Um, I mean, as I said, there are, yes, there are these other minor characters, but in taking away the spotlight from the house, I think you, what you now have is an intense focus on the relationship between these, you know, the, well, the, the, obviously the siblings with their mother, um, the deus ex machina at the end, I, I think it's no coincidence that, I mean, you might expect Apollo to come out or, you know, maybe another god, but who comes out at the end? You know, the Dioscuri, Castor and Pollux, who are actually the only gods who are literally related to this family. They are the brothers <laughs> of Clytemnestra. So I think, again, the play is really interested in putting a spotlight on all these sibling relationships in all these different ways. So 
we can talk more about that later, but I, I, so I just think that there's something with the recognition thing that it's not just about drawing that line or drawing attention to the way in which these tokens work in Agamemnon. I think it's also kind of, it's, yeah, shifting our focus, I think, generally on, you know, the relationship between the two siblings. Um, right, and then there was another question. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry, what was the other question? <laughs> I mean, we, yeah, so, so the, the, the other question was about the comic elements in, in Euripides' Electra and, and how that, again, going back to this idea that our idea of tragedy is very different from yeah. perhaps fifth century tragedy. Um, and so if, if you could talk a little bit more about that, about the, um, the blends of comedy and of comic elements with tragic elements and, and how that sort of can reshape our idea yeah. of what tragedy actually is. Yeah, no, thank you. Yes, absolutely. Um, so yes, there is a lot of humorous elements or maybe perhaps um, also unexpected elements in this play. Now, what I find fascinating about this is that, um, again, I think it points to the ways in which we <laughs> expect or anticipate tragedy to behave. Um, so again, there's all these, uh, you know, again, there's a long history of focusing on, again, these sublime or heroic, tragic, whatever that means, elements of, you know, of Greek drama should have these deaths or these, uh, I don't know, laments. Um, but we lose sight, I mean, so in, in, in insisting on this very kind of reductive view of tragedy, just focusing on these elements, you kind of lose sight of the fact that in the surviving plays that we have, there's quite a lot of plays that don't end badly. There's happy ending plays. Um, you know, the, it, the, there's a lot of places throughout, again, the, what survives, and even in the fragments that point to the fact that the ancient conception of tragedy is a lot more expansive than our own. Um, and so I think with this play, um, you know, I, I always also think, I mean, for any of you who are interested in thinking about the realities of sort of fifth century tragedy or thinking about the larger performance context, one of the best um, sources or, you know, places where you can find evidence is comedy. So if you look at Aristophanes and if you look at those old comedies, I mean, obviously, a lot of them are concerned with the city of Athens and thinking about they're complaining about all kinds of laws and in and, 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 and wars. And, but there's also an intense focus on tragedy. Um, Euripides is a character <laughs> in a couple of comedies. Um, Agathon, another tragedian. Um, and I think uh, so. I, so I like I would like to think that and obviously, uh, you know, comedy has this also contentious relationship with tragedy. Um, but I would like to think that that also kind of points to the fact that, again, in antiquity, tragedy could also equally be interested in comedy <laughs> or, or, or in these, I mean, comic elements. I mean, what we know about old comedy also, I mean, especially most of what we know is from about Aristophanes, who is a little bit later than other old comic poets. And so we tend to separate the two. But, you know, they were, <laughs> they were part of the same atmosphere. And so I would, I, you know, I would like to think that, um, I mean, this play obviously ends with a, maybe... The ending, I would say, is, in my view, is very problematic. Because nothing is, I mean, yes, you have a deus ex machina, and famously, a deus ex machina ale allegedly solves everything, but not this one, I don't think. I think there's a lot of unanswered questions and unsettling uh, issues. Um, so I think, yeah, so, so, so just to, to go back to the question of, 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 of humor, I mean, I think, um, I think it, it, a lot of it is not just necessarily, we, we, we might find a humorous, but a lot of it is about sort of kind of opening up um, different possibilities, I think, for, for the genre. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting because, it, I mean, you will notice it tonight. Um, the play has, is divided into two, two big acts. Um, so there's, there's an interval between act one and, and act two. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't divided in, into acts in, in antiquity, but um, the, the first one sort of ends with, Orestes and Electra uh, finally deciding what to do, what the plan is to kill the mother. And then the second, the second part is, is the killing of the mother. And you will see that the first part is a lot more humorous than, than the second one. So it's, there's a shift in genre, as well as a shift in, in the kind of the atmosphere yeah. in, in, within the play that I don't know if it was sort of enhanced and emphasized in the, in the, in the performance, in the, in the production that you will see tonight. But I think is is that. Yeah. Um, and I think also maybe maybe thinking specifically also of the structure of what happens, how the how Euripides and Electra unfold. I mean, those two parts in a way kind of make sense because again, if you think about the role of maybe say these minor characters, you know, the, the peasant, the, the old man who facilitates that 
that strange recognition in which Electra rejects everything. I mean, in a way, there's a buildup. You're, 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 you're moving toward a de the decision that is made about how to kill the parents. But in the, in the buildup to that, um, especially as you interact, um, as, well, as the two siblings are <laughs> slowly getting to know one another, I think there's a lot of possibility for, I guess, humor. Yeah. Um, whereas once you have the focus on how to carry out the death, um, you know, Aegisthus is first to go, and obviously there's a messenger report, very, very tragic, <laughs> uh, in terms of, you know, thinking of the genre and sort of one of, that's one of the sort of the key core elements of Greek tragedy, the messenger, and then, of course, the killing of, Agam of, of Clytemnestra <laughs> offstage. Um, so I, I do think so. So in a way, I mean, there's obviously Greek tragedy was not structured into, you know, in those two acts. Um, but I think that makes sense if you were to kind of like reduce it into sort of two general arcs. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. interesting. Um, so another another aspect that uh, the students um, um, sort of have, have had to uh, wrestle with was the chorus and the identity of, of this chorus of country women. Um, so so the, the, the question here is, what is the role of the chorus in, in Euripides' lecture and actually in Euripides' plays more generally, because it, it does change uh, and does differ from, from, from the way in which choruses are in the other two tragedians? Yes, this is a great question. And I think I heard one of the, one of you, the school groups talking about the chorus. Uh, um, so obviously the chorus, I mean, uh, for anyone who thinks about Greek tragedy, this is kind of one of the most sort of emblematic features of Greek tragedy, the chorus. You can think of the chorus in the way in which it generally structures a tragedy. So, I mean, as, you know, as we said just now, a Greek tragedy doesn't have acts, it has different episodes, but those episodes are transformed into episodes precisely because they come in between choral songs. So the chorus structures Greek tragedy in a really sort of obvious way. Um, so you have, you know, you know, certain scenes with actors, choral song, scenes with actors, choral song. Um, so you can think of the chorus having this just sort of structural uh, sort of characteristic. You can think of the chorus, I mean, people who talk about the chorus always emphasize this way in which they mediate between the stage and the audience. Um, so there's a lot of things that a chorus, I mean, of course, once they enter the stage in the Parados, they never leave. I mean, well, there are some exceptions. There are some tragedies in which there is a choral exit. But usually they're there on stage witnessing everything. Um, they can't really, there's a lot of moments, especially when there's an offstage cry, they can't really just rush on stage and find out what's happening or help. <laughs> they're, they're limited by their roles. So there are ways in which you can think about them doing that. Um, in this play, um, and I think generally in the Electra plays, um, this is something that fascinates me. Um, I think uh, the tragedians are interested in the relationship between, or exploring in the relationship between Electra and these choruses. Now I should say that in all the plays in which there's an Electra appears, the chorus is always a chorus of women, even in Orestes, right? So you know, it's always, the chorus is always kind of like a sounding board with Electra. There's something there about Electra and the chorus of, of these women. And I think, I mean, we can look to maybe perhaps part of the reason that there's, there's in, that the chorus is always female and always associated with Electra. You could argue that it's probably because of the, you know, the libation bearers, obviously they're unlike Aeschylus' Agamemnon, you don't have a chorus of old men. You have a chorus of women who, you know, one of the main things that Electra does in that play with that chorus is sing a huge, a big lament right, at the tomb, right, and you can think of the ways in which lament was a gendered activity, you know, it was, it was always done by women in the ancient world, so they performed this great lament at the tomb of Agamemnon in the libation bearers. Now, in Sophocles' Electra, um, you, so that it, it is, it's, what's fascinating there is that you still have another chorus who is still kind of lamenting with Electra, but I think, especially in the, in the opening song, in the Parados, um, which is shared between Electra and the chorus, they're kind of having a sung conversation about lament and about, there's a lot of their conversation, it's almost like they're talking about the limits of lament in, in the Sophocles. They're interested in kind of, they're doing it in the sung mode that kind of recalls this great lament that happened in the libation bearers, but they're interested in kind of exploring the limits of Electra's grief, like, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, through, um, through, I guess, the sum form. <laughs> so it's really fascinating. They're, they're, they're kind of interested in, ex in, in extending, uh, the, sorry, Sophocles and Euripides are interested in kind of extending this, this conversation or this relationship between these women. Now in Euripides' Electra, 
If you look at, I mean, this is another sort of charge that's been laid against this play. This play is terrible because these choruses are like, what are they doing? The first thing they do, they come in, they invite, you know, Electra to a festival of Hera. Like what, what, what does that have to do with anything? Um, and I think here with this particular chorus, um, and again, the shift in focus to the countryside, what, what you do find, um, I mean, it is difficult sometimes to kind of, you know, take stock and think about what is actually going on in a choral ode. Because sometimes, I mean, if you're reading it in translation, you lose sight of there's certain meters that sort of evoke other lyric genres or that give it a certain flavor um, that in antiquity would have resonated with an audience in a particular way. Sometimes they give you this other thematic, this context to kind of zoom out, and, you know. But in this play, <laughs> um, one of the things that the chorus tends to do, and again, through that invitation to the festival of Hera, um, I think they're kind of drawing, they're, they're focusing on another aspect of um, Electra's so in moving to the country, into countryside, Electra is kind of this outcast. So, um, and their frame, that invitation to the festival, um, which she refuses, I think draws attention to the fact that Electra no longer has this role as a leader of a chorus. So a young a woman of her status should, it should be a lead, you know, should be a leader in the society and she should take her role as the leader of the chorus. And the situation that I think it just draws attention to the unique nature of the situation that she can't do that. Um, I mean, she's, she's obviously emphasizing the ambiguity in the fact that Electra, who is, you know, in Greek, you know, obviously the, she's Electro, she's the one who's like denied the marriage bed here, she's married, but she's still a virgin. But um, so I think it's, it's kind of drawing attention to all those ambiguities, but also to the fact that she can't, she, she in, in no way can she take up her role, her expected role as kind of like a social leader of, you know, leading these choruses. And so there's a lot of emphasis in these choruses on dancing. Um, and they draw attention to, you know, do they talk about dancing? Sometimes there's another choral that also, you know, talks about um, the chorus of Nereids. Like there's, there's all these emphases, you know, on sort of female choruses and what they're doing and how they speak to the order of society. Um, also famously at the end, you know, when in the, in the Deus Ex Machina scene, uh, oh, sorry, no, sorry, before the Deus Ex Machina scene, when they're kind of, you know, Orestes and Electra regretting the matricide, um, you know, one of the things she says is like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm no longer going to be able to participate in dances. That's one of the outcomes of her, you know, killing her mother. And I think it just speaks to generally the foundational role that some of these dances and dancing had in Greek society. So it's a little bit more subtle. <laughs> it's not quite really sort of exploring the, you know, the limits of grief or lament as in Sophocles, or it's not performing that sort of great homos, that great lament um, you know, that, that women did, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, at, around the body as in the Aeschylus, but here you're doing something else that kind of just kind of highlighting or focusing on Electra's social status. Yeah, yeah. And um, so perhaps one, one last question before we hand it over to you. Um, going back to, to this a very interesting recognition scene. <laughs> Um, Orestes, so we focused on Electra, um, Electra and her not believing or her sort of over rationalizing the tokens that um, were so famously uh, in, in, in dramatized in Aeschylus' play. But why does Orestes take so much time to get himself revealed? And he doesn't in the end. It has to be someone, someone else. else. Yes. Well, this is fascinating. I think again, you know, there. I think there is a flirtation, or, or in, in terms of drawing attention to the ways in which other recognition scenes worked in other tragedies. But I think also this is what I mean about um, that. You know, the way that the students today, you know, in, here in the production have like made sense of those two arts or those two parts. And I think it it, it is kind of. I wouldn't call it humorous, but it, it is rather surprising, and I think it kind of draws attention to the ways in which maybe Euripides is maybe making you realize, like, you know, that <laughs> that you are expecting this to happen almost immediately, and then getting you to question um, all these dramatic conventions. No, but it, it is fascinating, and, and again, it, the fact that this recognition has to be mediated or facilitated by this other character. Um, you know, one of, and if you look at, you know, Greek art, there's all these scenes of like, you know, the sip, isn't there Orestes and Electra? That's like one of the, <laughs> the big themes in Greek art. And so I don't know if Europe is drawing attention or playing with that. Um, and especially the fact that it has to be done, that it's now done with this other character. I think that is very surprising. Yeah, yeah very um, funny. Yeah. Um, any, any questions from you? 
Yes. Yeah, well, I mean, so it depends which murders are you talking about? You're talking about Aegisthus and Clytemnestra, you're talking about Agamemnon. Right. Well, in the Sophocles, they happen in, I mean, in the, well, I guess you get, well, <laughs> yes. So, you know, you're right. I mean, I think in a way, um, yeah, playing with the order uh, uh, of murders, I think, I mean, I think there's, there is, I think there is probably maybe perhaps much more attention here paid to the fact that everything in tragedy has to happen within one single day. <laughs> there's also this, I mean, I think that, that, and I think with this myth in particular, um, yeah, so the, the action, as soon as it starts, it has to take place sort of right away. You don't have like three days later, you don't, you know, they don't have the capacity to do, you know, to skip in time or, I mean, maybe arguably through a choral old, maybe you can sort of reactivate or think about the past, but everything always happens or unfolds right before your eyes, right? Um, so I think um, what's fascinating in this play is and I think, especially focusing on the fact that Electra and Orestes are now more, are, you know, are grown up. I mean, some of these plays, especially with Sophocles and Electra, they're interested in the time in which, you know, the the, the length of time that it has taken for that for Agamemnon's murder to be avenged. That's something that I think is really important. Um, but in this play, I mean, I think both die right in the course of the action. I mean, you have you dispatch Aegisthus first, and then Clytemnestra. Um, I mean, I think, yeah, no, I think, it, I think to me, it just kind of just underlines that, that, that sort of strange thing about Greek tragedy. I mean, even though we're sort of located in this realm of myth, where you can actually literally think, I mean, it can sort of echo back to the sort of the, the distant, you know, heroic past. Everything always has to happen in Greek tragedy in that single day. So I think it's, it's just an interesting, and, and with these plays, I think it's an interesting tension because sometimes they also do draw attention to the length of time in which, yeah, all these, yeah, Agamemnon's murder especially has been unavenged. So, yeah. Any any other comments? Any other um, questions? In in those of you who are coming online as well, you can put, you can put your questions in the chat um, if you want to. Yes. Less serious than um, Clytemnestra murdering Agamemnon. Ooh, this is this is a loaded question. <laughs> um, it depends what you mean by that. I mean, I, it's right. I mean, I think basically, um, are we talking? Are you talking specifically about Athens or fifth century Athens? I mean, I think there's there's all kinds of laws that I think govern uh, murder. Uh, I am not the person to ask about that, but I think. Um, yeah, it's a very loaded question because I think in a way, um, for me, see, see I'm, I'm not interested, I guess, in a way to think about placing these Greek tragedies uh, or, you know, finding correspondences with, with Athenian society. So I, so I, this is in, in my work, I'm, I'm, so I, I do think that there are ways in which these myths ask general questions that were preoccupying the minds of the audience. Um, but I, personally don't I, I don't find these sort of correspondences between laws because for me what I find really fascinating about this material is that especially thinking about say comedy this is all mythical right so this is not set in Athens this is dealing with these families from you know around whom there's all these stories and you know sort of a long tradition of stories so um so so the reason why I say that is so, so there are there is a question here and some people have tried to talk about say um, you know, the Homeric conception of, you know, there's certain laws in Homer or thinking about archaic Greek society. So when, when, when uh, some of these Homeric epics may have been the <laughs> first before, you know, sort of uh, composed, there's questions about sort of what archaic society had expectations in terms of murders and because the murder of Iphigenia is very much tied to the Trojan War. When it comes to thinking about fifth century, you know, Athens, I mean, I know there are some folks who work on tragedy and 
want to find these correspondences between the mythic material in as dramatized in tragedy and fifth century Athens. But for me, the fact that it's mythical means that it's sort of a step, you know, it's, it's, it's removed from reality. Now, when you talk about comedy, on the other hand, in Greek comedy, Aristophanes very much, he, you are in Athens and they talk about specific laws and specific things. So this, this is just kind of, into, but to go back to your question, I mean, I think, so I'm not, I mean, I, I do think it's interesting to think about the role or what the murder of Iphigenia facilitates or introduces to the story and when it is emphasized, right? Um, so, and, and so you have to think about, if you, especially if you look at, you know, sort of all these other plays, is it mentioned, like, where is it mentioned? Who sort of places emphasis on this, you know, this, this murder and what, and what role does it have in your understanding of, or in your understanding of the justification of the murder of Clytemnestra and Aegisthus and uh, revenge? So there's all these, it, to me, it raises all these larger questions. Um, but I think because we're dealing with this mythical material, I think if you want to understand it from a perspective of law or what the ancients thought, that's a very complicated question because it's, again, who, which ancients are you talking about? The fifth century Athenians, archaic Greek society or whatever, you know, there's all these layers. Um, it's, it's very tricky, I think, um, to sort of kind of like focus on that question. I mean, I think we could generally say we thought it was bad, but I mean, for me, I'm interested in from a much more sort of dramatic and literary perspective, like what is that murder or that justification, you know, if it, what does it introduce? How does it change the story? How does it enable you to think about the matricide in a different way? Um, so, <laughs> so I gave you a very, <laughs> you may not be satisfied with that answer, but <laughs> I, I do think it's important to emphasize that there are multiple, I mean, for me, I don't think there's much value in looking at Greek tragedy and trying to find one-to-one -one correspondences yeah. with Athenian law. I think that's, that's just, now, until we invent the time machine and we can go back and you know find out and but I admit for comedy I think that question is fantastic because again they are referring you know Aristophanes refers to quite a lot of real life event you know events um, you know and there's complaints about politicians but when it comes to tragedy again we're in this mythic world right so do normal laws apply in that mythic world I don't think they do <laughs> but yeah but it's a fantastic question <laughs> thank you yeah and and in that sense you can. I think compare the Agamemnon with Aeschylus' Agamemnon with uh, your views of lecture. I think you'll find interesting things in, you know, along these lines of you know what, how does it change how does it change the story? Yeah. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Yes. Yes. This is a this is a great question. I think maybe. Um, yeah, maybe also to link it back to this idea of the Iphigenia. I mean, I think again, so with these dramatizations of myths, I mean, what you find again, as I was saying earlier, is you have a different shift in focus in the story, or at least it enables you to find new angles into these myths that you, that I guess people, you know, thought they knew and loved. Um, so the character of Electra, I mean, we need to recognize in a way that um, when, I mean, uh, we, we think she first sort of stepped on the Athenian stage in the libation bearers, right? Um, so she, her appearance or her emergence in Greek theater really does change things quite drastically for the myths of this family. Um, if you look at, you know, sort of artistic representations of myth or even earlier mythical narratives around this family, this was a story of kind of a bread and butter story of, it was all about Orestes. It was about the, his vengeance. And, you know, and, and early in other versions too, I mean, the role of Clytemnestra maybe is also less significant. It was always Aegisthus. And you can link it to the idea of, I mean, what is he? Is he his cousin? What is it? It's all about the house of Atreus and these two brothers. And it's a very, it's a, I guess, tried and you know, it's, a, it's a familiar story of men and power and dynasty, you know, so, and so Orestes, it's, he has to avenge the death of his father. By Aegisthus. But now, when you introduce, going back to again the great question about Iphigenia, when you now introduce Clytemnestra as a character, when you introduce this motive of Iphigenia, you're adding, you're enhancing, you're, you're sort of shifting focus in the story, and it no, no longer becomes about, um, you know, this dynastic power. It becomes about the effect, the, the, the you know, on the whole family, right? So what? Um, and with Electra, obviously, when she emerges, she adds a whole other flavor to the story, a whole other dimension to the story, which I think, I mean, obviously, we need to recognize that in the Libation Bearers, she only appears for 
She's only there for the first 400, 500 lines of the play, and then she disappears. Then it becomes a rest story again. But in Sophocles and Euripides, they're really fascinated, I think, with this other dimension. And as I said, with, in the Sophocles, I think he is really interested in her character as this unwedded virgin who has literally seized her life. Her whole life has been altered entirely by the death of her father. And all she does is grieve. And she's a figure of grief. And so you also have that extra dimension in that play. Here, again, um, through her, I mean, you know, she's now conveniently, I mean, obviously she, uh, as a woman, you know, there's a, there's a lot of interest too in sort of the role of, um, of women in, in the society. She, she's now married to this farmer. She's away from the palace. Um, and I think this play is really interested in exploring um, Electra's role as an actor in the story, in the myth. So she is now taking part in the matricide. Um, you know, she does it with Orestes here. Um, they both obviously regret it, you know, together. Um, so I, 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 do, I do think that, again, that shift in focus, I mean, I think they're interested in all these possibilities and kind of like, I, I would like to think of Euripides as kind of zooming out or kind of like, you have this intense, you know, the story of, again, there's always Orestes' vengeance. But then you're kind of zooming out and introducing all these sort of extra elements and seeing what happens. Of course, if you look at the Orestes, I, I highly encourage you all to read the Orestes um, after this. Again, you have all of our all of our favorite characters here. You have Orestes and Electra, um, but you also then suddenly have Menelaus and Helen, and you remember, oh yes, Clytemnestra is Helen's sister, and these there's other people in this family as well. Um, their daughter Hermione. There's, so I think there are ways in which, again, it's this kind of zooming out enables you to focus on um, these intricate familial relationships in these myths. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Um, in the chat. Yes, two. There we go. Both of you. <laughs> yes. Yes, so it, it, the character, if it was another brother, you mean? Yes, I mean, I think, absolutely. Because um, as I said, again, um, you know, and also just thinking, just maybe focusing on the chorus. I mean, all these choruses, they're deliberately choruses of women because I think they're interested in exploring all these different aspects and dimensions of Electra's character that are as a woman. Um, if you had another brother, I mean, there's also, I guess, what would that look like? Would, that, would, would you then emphasize you know, the, the two original, you know, the, the, eight, the house of Atreus and the two brothers. And, um, and I guess there's always this question of if there's, is Electra older than Arrest? Yes, she's older than Arrest. So I guess, well, that brother would probably have a claim to the throne over Arrest. Um, yeah, no, I think, yes, that would be very different. Also, I mean, would, um, would this male character have the same, you know, relationship or, you know, would you have that same wonderful scene with Clytemnestra that's about, you know, her fake birth. <laughs> um, so no, so I think there's all these things that would be lost if you just had, if you removed um, Electra and if you maybe focus much more on sort of, you know, male characters in the family. Um, but yeah, so that's a great question. <laughs> Hmm. Um, whew, that's, I think, let's see, um, I think in modernity or just in general, a lot of people have looked, I mean, the thing is, yeah, have looked at the, um, the relationship between these two, which is, I think, ambiguously defined in, in, in the Greek as being, you know, they're always together, they they support each other as being um, a, a kind of a, a, something, I think they're emblematic of, you know, sort of, of gay or queer relationships. Um, in modernity. And I think um, there's been a number of productions actually that have taken that up and um, have explored that in really fascinating ways. Um, when it comes to, you know, obviously there, there, there's a lot of things that we can do when we think about, well, applying some of our conceptions of things into, into ancient Greece. I mean, they don't, I mean, <laughs> they don't quite match up. Our, our understanding of some of these relationships don't match up to realities in ancient Greece. But I do think you're right. I think a lot of modern productions and modern adaptations have really sort of seized on this. What I find fascinating about Pylades in the in Greek theater is that, I mean, he's there. He's kind of his new character. I mean, when do, actually, he does speak. <laughs> yeah. 
I dare you to find out where, 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 where does he actually speak? Where does he stop being this mute character? But I, I find it sort of from, from that perspective as a, you know, from drama, fascinating. Like someone who is a named and known character being completely mute um, and, and sort of what that meant in terms of sort of Greek theater. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I know, but yeah, that's, that's a fantastic question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosa. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, I hope I hope you like the play and uh, let's give Rosa a round of applause. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>